in the five years between 2010 and 2015, teenage depression rates grew by 33%, lapping that of the general adult population by four times. However, just three out of 10 teens are being treated for their depression. Female adolescents are twice as likely to, to develop depression as their male peers. And for the first time in more than 20 years, we're more likely to kill ourselves than kill someone else. Sadly, this doesn't come at a surprise. We know, or at least we think we do, too well the epidemic of teenage depression. Good evening, my name is Emily, and tonight I'll be talking about the biology of depression and some of the misunderstandings around antidepressants. Over the past few years, parallel with the rise in teenage depression rates, came articles blaming schools, parenting, social, social media, pop culture, anything and everything having to do with students for the rise in teenage depression rates. Now, if you know me, know that I'm a very happy person. So the kids out there were sad, and this situation was sad, but it wasn't something I could find very relatable. In the audience seat, watching the numbers rise and the fingers point didn't mean much. It was yet another author with yet another solution to yet another seemingly distant problem. Until the day, one of my closest friends told me she had moderate depression. I both expected it and didn't expect it. But, but as I was processing this information, she told me that her therapist suggested her to use antidepressants, and she was leaning towards accepting this form of treatment. I knew that this was an issue to be discussed between her family and her, but I still couldn't help but feel worried. There was something off about her being happy because of happy pills. What if she's shackled by her meds? Will she be addicted to this medication-induced happiness? And is this happiness even real? Or will it be artificial giddiness every time you see her smiling, laughing? Will she still be herself? Or will she become a stranger in the shell of my friend? I didn't want to lose the her I know and grew to love. So selfishly, I thought to myself that I'd rather see her be unhappy, but still her, than happy, but someone else. Against my common sense, I told her this. She looked at me incredulously and said none of it was going to happen. Carried away by predispositions and myths, I hadn't realized how wrong I had been about antidepressants until then. As she gradually told others, she was bombarded by similar false notations of depression and antidepressants. I gradually realized, that as a self-perceived woke and open-minded community, we think we understand depression, but in actuality, we may be perpetuating the very stereotypes harming this invisible community. So let's see how much this community knows about depression biology. To the game, two truths and a lie. Two of these statements are true, and one of them is a lie. Uh, so, show of hands, who thinks statement one is true? So, a good, a good half, a good three quarters. Who thinks statement two is true? I mean, who thinks statement two is false? <laughs> who thinks statement three is false? So, neurologists have tried to understand the biochemistry of depression, but the brain is still largely mapped. So the bulk of research done on depression can only prove perhaps correlations rather than certain causations. However, the one thing we do know is that depression is not just the, is not just the effect of chemical imbalance. There are too many other factors with variance between people that could cause depression. So stating that depression is just not enough of chemical A or too little of chemical B is a vast and poorly evidenced understatement of what depression really is. Stress, for one, may be linked with depression tendencies. When the mind is under enough stress, a hormone called cortisol will be released. Cortisol tells cells to speed up metabolism and activate energy stores in the fat. It's a fight or flight evolutionary advantage we have kept to this day. However, elevated levels of cortisol in the bloodstream has been an indicator of major depression. In a study on later life depression, many of a severely depressed patient pool had hypercortalism, or excess cortisol. 
in a other community-based study, researchers found that those severely depressed had higher morning and evening cortisol levels than other participants in the study. Other traits associated with depression, such as the rumination of negative thoughts and anhedonia, the inability to find happiness in things that normally make you happy, have all been connected with specific neurological abnormalities. From this, it is evident that depression is not the normal and in no way a form of personality. Treating depression does not make one less authentic. It, in fact, returns a person to their original state. So just as a fever-inflicted body requires Tylenol, the depression-inflicted brain requires something else. Antidepressants. As we all know, these are one of the most common forms of treatment for depression. But how do antidepressants really work? It's a common misconception that antidepressants add more of or simulate the production of certain chemicals in the brain, such as dopamine or serotonin. But in actuality, the vast majority of antidepressants do their job by suppressing a neurological mechanism called reuptake. They are reuptake inhibitors. Reuptake is a natural process of chemical reabsorption into neurons after they have been released. But when this process is inhibited, the, the chemicals that were going to be reabsorbed instead stay in the gap between two neurons called the synapse. Theoretically, keeping levels of certain chemicals high can improve communication and strengthen circuits in the brain, leading to more positive moods. But since chemical imbalance affects different patients differently, antidepressants are not effective for all. In a 2007 study on antidepressants, it had been shown that only 20% only 20 of patients actually felt better after using antidepressants. The rest either felt only minusculely better or not better at all. Addiction. Addiction is a very rare issue in the antidepressant realm because antidepressants don't actually contain any chemically addictive substance. Eating too much, eating more than recommended does not make you happier, and eating too many doesn't give you any significant high. So, it is evident that addiction, so it is very rare that addiction becomes an issue when consuming antidepressants. Our lives are very complex, but sometimes we get lost in the complexities of our own lives, and we forget that other people lead lives just as complex, if not even more. Death, divorce, the inability to keep up to standards seemingly impossible to reach, apathetic parents or ununderstanding friends. And there may not be much we can do to help, but at the very least, we can try to understand. Thank you for listening to my TED Talk.